On this episode, I invite Tucker Max to jam with me. Chuck, and this is episode 207 of the Ask Gary V Show. I'm excited. We've got a guest. I'll let this wonderful man introduce himself. I know a lot of you know who he is. Uh, it's post Memorial Day, but first and foremost, more importantly than anything else, I want to give a huge shout out to my baby daughter, Misha. Happy seventh birthday. I will be running out of here in a second to go see you at school, do the cupcake thing. I'm very excited. I love you with all my heart. Speaking about love, India. Hi. It's good to see you. Good to see How you. How you been? Too. You've been good. like on, you've been away forever. I feel. I feel like I haven't seen you in years. I. I Did you went, go to the West Coast or something? No, I was I was in D.C. for one night on Thursday. Oh, right, that was cool. That you was had a good cool. Time? Yeah, yeah. I went to see a movie at the White House. Was it fun? It was it was awesome. It was Did really you see cool. the president? No, he was out of town. He let me know though before talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he let you know. Yeah, he was so like, what's going on? Know. Good. You got the questions. I have the questions. You ready for the show? I'm ready for the show. All right, let's go to our guest, my friend. Why don't you tell the Vayner Nation? Uh, actually, I will eat the salad while you do this part. Uh, who you are and what you're up to? All right. So my name is Tucker Max. I wrote a book called I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, which spent <laughs> like half a decade on the bestseller list, and there was a movie made about it and whatever. And now I have a company called Book in a Box. That's, and that's what is book in the box? We turn ideas into books. So okay. like, uh, if you have an idea for a book and you don't want to sit at a computer for a year typing it out, we have a process where we interview you, we position the idea, structure it, create an outline, get everything is out of Is the your interview head. process almost like a version of ghostwriting which then allows the book to be created? No, so ghostwriting is like, if, if you're hiring a ghostwriter, yep. you're hiring someone to write their version of your ideas in yep. your book. And then you're paying them so you can put your name on it. Yes. With us, uh, our process doesn't work if you don't know exactly what you're talking about because it's all your own content. Right. We're adding nothing to it. We just have a very, it's almost like an algorithm, but a structured process where great writers and editors are guiding you through it, asking questions. So it feels like magic to you. All you're doing is talking about what you already know. Well, you know what's weird about this? This is how actually That's I That's how you like, do yeah. it, I know. I, I basically just like talk and get interviewed by Steph and just like, to we, me like all, and then I, I don't know if in your world this works, and then I basically, all the editing that I do is always like, wait a minute, like basically my dream scenario is that a, she helps me structure for sure. Like the thought of like one continuous run. Oh, yeah, no. I'd have one long run on sentence. Of course, that'd of be course. my book. Uh, and two, grammar. Yeah. But and then but then like any word scares the like I'm always petrified. Like, do I even say that? Would I say that word? Like it's mm -hmm. really just the transcription of the conversation. Yeah, it's, we don't do transcription. It's more we interview and then because yeah, you know, spoken it. word is different than written. Hundred percent. So once we've got it structured, then the interview, the job of the the editor is to interview you, get everything out of your head, and then once it's transcribed, to can translate that into written. Uh, and written how did prose. this happen? Was this a scenario where? Where you know it's funny. This this is the first time we're meeting, right? Yeah, which is crazy because we, we have seriously have a, hundreds a of friends. In friends. Right. So what I know from afar is you know did it, I assume what happened was you had this. In, actually, you know what? Let's take it there for a second. Like this book is a, was a smash hit. My first one, yeah. Right, wow. and like you definitely didn't think that's what was going to happen. Of course not. How did you even get to the point of writing that first one? Man, uh, it's kind of like, funny. Why'd you write a book? I, I started, um, well, I went to law school. Okay. My friends and I all went to different cities to work. Okay. And uh, I got your fired. Law, your law school friends? Yeah, right. Okay. All, uh, all law school friends. I got fired. Where'd you grow in, up? Uh, Kentucky. Like, Love it. Total BFE Kentucky. Nowhere Love it. Kentucky. Yeah. No, you don't. Actually, like, no you love it because Kentucky. you didn't grow up there. It's a terrible place. Okay. It's a terrible place. Yeah, like, there's a reason everyone leaves. Got it. So, um, middle of nowhere Kentucky. Right. And then, where, and then where did you go to school? Uh, University of Chicago for undergrad, then Duke for law school. Impressive. Yeah. No more yeah. Kentucky taught you something. School's easy once you learn how to hack the system. I it's never hard. figured that part out. Okay, and so you go and do that, and so you think you're gonna be a lawyer? Yeah. That's like, what's up? Mm -hmm. And then I got fired. And for, like, for nowhere Kentucky, that was like, holy shit, you made it. Yeah, sort of. I okay. came from a family um, that, uh, I don't, they weren't really rich, but pretty well known. And a lot, In the I, area. Yeah, like uh, my grandfather was a doctor. My mom was one of the first women to ever, or, sorry, my grandmother was one of the first women to ever graduate from the University of Kentucky. So I came from a family of achievers. 
uh, like my great 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 grandfather was um, a U.S. senator. Like you know, maybe four greats, way far back. Um, so you so. needed this book to get into the game. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. So so you go to you you go to law school. You get some buddies. You guys go to different places. Where did you go? What city? I moved. I moved to Silicon Valley to Mountain View. Mm. I was working for a firm called Fenwick and West. Mm, I know that. Um, yeah, right. Of I've course. Used them for some of my deals. There you go. Well, they fired me. Amazing. <laughs> and I deserved it though. <laughs> they weren't dicks. I deserved to be fired. Because I got well. So the reason I thought I got fired was I got super drunk at this big law firm event. Yeah. Uh, and I there was like an auction, and I grabbed the mic and I basically uh, yelled at the other people who were bidding on me for yeah. this thing, and it was really funny. Uh, but it was kind of mildly inappropriate, but not. It, it didn't quite cross the line, and uh, I thought I got fired. This was from, to win a date with you? No, no, no. To uh, win, like, like the an managing hour partner. Time? It was something like the hiring partner was like driving people around for a night. You know, it was a charity auction. I get it. it. Was I some totally nonsense get it. thing. Yep. And I was blind drunk, like double fisting bottles of wine. I was a twenty-five-year-old moron. You were drinking wine? Oh yeah, dude. I love that. Keep <laughs> it was going. in Silverado. It was at the Very resort. Good. Yeah, in Napa. Um, so uh, <laughs> double. I don't know what I was drinking though. I was hammered, and I thought that's why I got fired, but the real reason is actually because the senior female partner in the firm propositioned me, and not I did the worst possible thing. I turned her down, and then I told everybody. <laughs> like, if I had slept with her, I would have been basically bulletproof. And this is what happened. And if I, yeah, if I had shut up, I'd have been fine, right? Okay. So uh, I ended up getting fired. Um, it was both things combined. I was a reckless, unguided missile. I had no business working in a law firm. They were totally right to fire me, but the real instigating factor was that So what too. happens what happens next? You're fired the next day. Then I go work for my dad. Oh, well, it was kind of like a whole mess. I basically got blackballed from the legal profession because I wrote my friends an email about it, like about the event, the drinking, yes. right? That was like Saturday, and I ended up getting fired Wednesday. So on Monday, I wrote this really funny email. Send it to my friends. I get fired. And of course, my friends are dicks, so they forward this email to everybody. What year is this? This is, oh, 2000, 2001. Um, Back when people forwarded to course, their entire this is, list. Of course, this is before MySpace or right. anything like that. And the so, original social media. Exactly, email, it's email forwards. Uh -huh. So uh, I get blackballed from the legal profession because yep. everyone gets this email yep. of me telling the yep. story. So uh, I go work for Let my- Let me ask you a real straight up question that I'm curious if it's ever been asked. How much subconsciously or consciously a Did lot. You? I know exactly what you're yeah. going to ask. And Do people right ask question. that? No. Yeah, right? Nobody's, no. Everybody's no scared to ask right. you yeah. the right question. I'm not scared, so right. and I want to bring value. Like, I, I'm listening to this, I'm like, mm-mm. I'm like, this guy, you're right. You're right? right? You're right. Did you actually know you had this in you to be like, did you think you were a comedian? Did you think you were a culture hack? Like, what did you no. think was brewing? Here's the real right? answer. Because you understood something was brewing. Yeah. There's the no way you're here and had that, you see where I'm going? So we were talking about this actually, she went to law school too, and um, uh, like, I, I think being a lawyer is a terrible job, for the okay. most part, for most people. Okay. And I, I'm pretty high energy, I'm pretty creative, I'm pretty entrepreneurial, I like to do things uh, in different, and that's the opposite of what you have to be, if yeah. you're a lawyer, you're just following rules yeah. and you're someone else's paper monkey. Of course. And I think I realize that, but I, quite honestly, dude, I don't think I have the courage uh, to do anything about it, or yeah. the emotional maturity even recognize that. Yeah. So that's where the unconscious stuff comes mm -hmm. in. It's like, I'm gonna act out and force them yep. to do something that I don't have yep. the courage to do myself, especially at 25, yep. no way. And so what happens next? Uh, I went to work for my dad. He owns a restaurant company in South Florida. So I actually know a lot about wine because I come from a rest my other side of my family's restaurants. That's cool. Yeah, and um, then he, <laughs> He ends up firing me <laughs> six months later. My own dad fires me from the family my, business. My dad fired my sister. My Actually, here's an unknown fact. My dad fired me once. <laughs> I was fired by Sasha. This is a real thing. I, who worked every minute of my goddamn life, once asked in my senior year to leave at 7 p.m., which was considered early, a 10 yeah. hour day, yeah. to go to a graduation party, and my dad said I wasn't committed to the business. Your own stuff. graduation? At my own high school grad. <laughs> I just want to say, I worked every day of high school, every weekend, every summer vacation. Like, this whole, like, this weekend, I spent time with my family. We just have, we got a place, and we're like, I'm like, I finally understand why people love summer so much, because yeah. I never had one since seventh grade, and my dad fired me. So I understand being fired by your dad. Yeah, well, and by the way, I won that battle, and dad, you know it, because I then was pumped, because I had two days free to myself in the summer. I was like, 
wait a minute. Like I hung out with my friends, I played wiffle ball, I went to a baseball card show. I was not asking to come back and then my dad had to say, you can come. And my dad said, I'm picking you. What'd he say? He walked in my room, he's like, I'll see you at seven in the morning. I'm like, all right, I guess I'm back. <laughs> Dude, I think this is the difference between you and me. I didn't get fired for that stuff, man. I got fired because I was a jackass. Like I got fired for totally legit reasons. I think, uh, the long, long story basically is that my dad had a bunch of clowns working for him, and I was 25 and stupid and didn't understand anything about the world. So I thought, all right, my dad's got a great business, I know I can expand this. And I went in and I told the clowns working for him that they weren't good enough to work there and I was gonna get them fired and yeah. I was gonna build this business. Yeah. This is my social intelligence yeah. at the time. And of course these people all know office politics and my dad much yeah. better than I do, right? Yeah. But I still think it doesn't matter, I'm right and my name's on the door, obviously my dad's gonna pick me. So then I also give them all the ammunition in the world by doing things like, um, you know, I'll meet some girl at the right. And I'm, so wait, real quick, like just because I think this is the important theme for them trying to bring them value, again you think subconsciously? Yes. Well, so here's what happens. Let me, let me ask you really, qu the question that's burning inside of me, did you, know that you had this kind of like personality that you, did you literally think that, like did you understand the internet well enough at that point? Did, but did you think that you were gonna become famous or a personality? I, I, uh, the God honest answer is, um, I mostly like lucked real, in, like, like, I, I really honestly mostly lucked into a lot of stuff. Uh, I lucked into a lot of opportunities. I picked up those opportunities and busted my ass once I had did, them. Did you think that you had a likable personality to dudes and bros? No, because I was no different than my nine friends. Like the dude, the guys that right, went so to law school. Feel, it didn't feel different. I, in the terms of intelligence right. or social uh, yep. uh, ability or funny, I was dead in the middle of right, that. Right. I had a lot of friends who were funnier than yep. me. Smart. I'm just the dude who wrote it all down. And the reason I wrote it down, so like uh, I get fired. And so is that what the book was? The, they were stories? The, the first like eight stories in the book are That's emails I sent my friends. They're emails. So, actually, now real quick, and I know we have questions because this is being more of an interview than the Ask Review show, but I'm enjoying it. Plus, there's like eight years of pent up friendships. So <laughs> right, like, exactly. I just want to get some context. Um, how did the book deal happen? Uh, so I actually um, I, I tried to get published. So I, I wrote these emails to my friends about all the stories, the dumb things I did. They got me fired, like having a girl. Yep. You know, I hooked up with some girl in the bathroom when I was on shift and yep. all these sort of things. Yep. Uh, so it gave all the people ammunition to talk bad about me and my dad. He fires me. And I write emails about all the dumb things I'm doing, drinking, hooking up with these girls in South Florida. And um, those emails, my friends are like, that's the funniest. This is the funniest stuff I've ever read. Like, you're not that funny in person, but you're, you're a funny email. Were you getting an amazing like high from the feedback of your friends reacting so much it was mostly it, just it, so my, it wasn't about writing, it was about making my friends laugh. Mm -hmm. I, it, it never occurred to me that anyone would think these emails were funny mm -hmm. outside of my nine friends. Right. And they're like, so after I get fired from both jobs, one of my friends is like, look man, you don't, you're not good at anything else, but you're real good at writing these emails. Right. This is what you should do. And it never occurred to me to be a writer at that point. So I sent my emails, every agent, every publisher, this is 01, late 01. Every, or maybe early 02, every one I could find, 100%, without exception, rejection. And most people ignored it, and the people that responded were like, uh, rude. Rude. Yeah. Well, actually, most like of them were. Dick face. Well, most of it was just <laughs> form rejection. Yeah. There were three or four, like, personalized, you're the worst writer I've ever right. seen. You need I, to I, go I, die. I genuinely hate you. Right. Dear Tucker, I hate you. All right, I got into writing to keep people Harvard like comments. you out of it. <laughs> Seriously, for real. And so. Uh, so, who so, published you? So after that, I ended up getting um, this dude, Jeremy Ruby Strauss, who worked at Kensington, which was a small publisher, still is kind of a small publisher. Uh, he found my blog, loved it, thought so it was you, the funniest so thing minute, ever So wait a there's a little piece there. You started putting these, you started putting right. these articles up. So, uh, you know what I'm trying to so say? This is such a business show. What I'm more fascinated by and I, and I, is you clearly knew what was happening with the current state of the internet during that period of time. You're doing email so that you know we're getting forwarded. You just went into a blog. If you're talking about 0102, yeah. what are you blogging on? Blogger or TypePad? Or? GeoCities. G so like, GeoCities. So this is the part that I think is most interesting to me. TypePad. Because, because, right, Man, so, right so, so to that point, to me, always thinking about how to extract value. Right. Such a big portion knows who you are, read the book, things of that nature, but so many don't. Right. To me, again, here's another person that executed in a platform that was underrated attention 
and used well, it to expand. The, the thing is, I get rejected by all the gatekeepers, right? This is still a 102. I get rejected by all of so them. I have nowhere else to do. So that's when the internet was kind of, GeoCity was starting to, to blow up. So I was like, well, I'll just put my stories up for free. And everyone literally laughed at me because that's just, they're like, how could you do that? You have to charge for writing. And I'm like, I got nowhere else to publish this. Distribution. And then it blew up. Like it took about four what to six called? months. Uh, it was called TuckerMax.com or something. Even was, better. Right. That's what I mean. And, and so, like, uh, this girl ended up suing me because I wrote about her. It was all true. Did you say her name? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. But it was, it was all 100% true. Okay. And uh, I, it was a big First Amendment case. She got this uh, a temporary restraining order issued. It was, like, prior restraint. A long, long story. Uh, but it blew my side up. And then after that, it got all this traffic. And I won the case because I was telling the truth and I was right. And uh, then uh, publishers all came back to me. And then the guy I ended up going with was the one who like really built Showed the best the most, relationship, yeah. right? Yep. And then, uh, then the book didn't come out until 06. That was 02, 03. Why did uh, it take so long? You had more uh, shenanigans? Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of bullshit. <laughs> yep. It's just long yep. the mainstream publishing and yep. all that stuff. But the cool thing is I built my email list the whole time, not even trying. I didn't really understand it. I just had the email list because it's the easiest way to reach people. And that's yeah, it's how, how, I started. It's how you started. And so by the time the book came out, I had 50, 100,000 people. So I sold 6,000 copies the first week. No, I, literally zero reviews. No one talked about this book anywhere. I hit the New York Times bestseller list out of nowhere. Right. And I was the first. My book was the very first one to go blog to bestseller. Love it. Very first. Yeah. And then did you get a lot of coverage for that? Not really. That was still back when media, that yeah. was, you know, still they're like, uh, who are these blog people, yep. these internet yep. people? They yep. don't matter. They That's don't right. exist. This is when? Uh, 06. January of 06. That's when the, right when uh, Wine Library TV started. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, no, I remember your wine show was blowing up about the same yep. time mine uh, was. You were just in a different, Genre. there were all these people yep. that different kind of finding their ways into things kind of by accident. Yep. Um, yeah, and so then... Book took off. The book kind of took off and then went down and then built by word of mouth after that. Like people credit me for all, I've done all these marketing things like, oh, it's so smart. I honestly don't think any of that stuff mattered. I think the fact that I wrote a great book that a lot of people loved and told their friends about. And you referenced really earlier matters. first book. You've written how, more than one? Four. Four. Yeah. Uh -huh. and you Three, still love yeah, four in that genre. Yep. Like the New York Times called it fratire, which yep. makes no sense because I wasn't in a fraternity. Yep. But whatever. Um, and then now, you know, like I retired from that because. I, you, you, had your you, run. you can't act like your 20s and your 40s. It's That's annoying. right. Well, all right. India. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, first, we move Taylor. India's going to ask questions. We're going to answer them. Shoot. Let's do it. <laughs> Taylor asks What's been the biggest key to your creative process and ability to tell stories that connect to people? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. So, um, uh, the way I always frame it, and I think it's I started this way by accident, and, and I've just stayed this way, is I started writing because I was trying to make nine people laugh, right? You know like the saying, uh, if you if you want to change the world, uh, you've got to change one, one person. Start with either yourself or one person yeah. first. I think the same thing is true for storytelling. If you can't make a small group of people laugh or react in whatever way you're, you're looking dead. at, you can't get a big group to do it, right? And so I, every time I write, I always think, uh, uh, consciously in my head, who is my audience? Why do they care? Who? Super interesting. I so, you know, you guys have heard Sally Arkansas. Uh, his world would be like Rick Polo. Like I imagine these people that right. I think there's way more than nine of them. Your nine buddies represent 22% of dudes right. in America. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why it's a big audience. And that's what I think about here, right? Even the way I interviewed in the first 10, 15 minutes here, I'm like, okay, I know who's watching, right? right. I, whether boy, what girl, black, white, green, alien, they're entrepreneurial, they care about things. And like, as I was listening and getting more context to what I generally knew, I'm like, this guy won and did well in books. I'm like, wait a minute, this guy knew this guy knew with yeah. email forwarding and, and blogging very early, again, always trying to drill home for them that white space. So that's what I do. I reverse engineer what is the biggest value. Wine Library TV worked because I was like, because I spent 10 years in a wine shop and watched people come in and people that were like Duke law lawyers. Super intimidated who were like, by wine. Super, like yeah. alpha males walking yeah. in this room being like, I need a wine, like, like break. And I'm like, God, wine world is so douchey, so suppressive. In the same way I think about entrepreneurship, right? Now, like, I just want to empower people to be like, who gives a shit what people, like, just do it. Mm -hmm. Like, so, yeah. anyway, reverse engineers, very similar. Go ahead. Yeah. Jonathan wants to know, last time I heard the name Tucker Max, I finished I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. Lots has changed. Would you do it all again? Of course. 
I mean, so I would, you here, right? I would try and do a lot of things differently. Like because what? I, What's the number? Oh, like in, in a no bullshit way, because yeah. I'm enjoying this. Because I think you, could, you know, there's like, no other way for me to be beautiful. No bullshit. But but knowing that, like again, back yeah. to I was happy when you're like, hey, uh, like I want to go to like a place where, like I know you've been on so many different things, like <clears throat> like in a very fucking real way. Like, what's the one core thing you think you would do different? Um, I would realize a lot earlier that it's not about me. Right. You know, even though I'm really good at doing that with my art, yes. like my stories, even though they're about me, if you read all four of my books, you actually don't know very much about me at all. You know a lot about things that happen to me and you've laughed a lot, you've really enjoyed it, but I don't, I don't burden the reader with nonsense about me because people reading my books want to be entertained. They're not trying to learn deep about my emotions, whatever, right? But in the way I made business decisions, uh, early in my career, I was arrogant and stupid and I made most of my decisions. Because you thought you had the leverage? Um, it, I, I, so there was a movie made about my first book. That movie should have done a hundred million or more at the box office, and it did like two million. And because? I think, I mean, because of my arrogance and my hubris, and you because, wanted to impose certain things that you had creative control over. Yeah, man. Yeah, it really was like writing is a very singular art, yeah. right? It's all so, like I, yeah. I don't have, I don't need anyone else's help to yeah. crush a book. To make a movie, it's a whole group of people. And the, even the smallest movie ever is still 50 and you, people. And you went it. into that place of like, look, it's I a, love you guys, but me, this is like... It has to be about me, right? Holding tight. Yeah. And, um, and I, it, because of that, I picked the wrong director. I picked most of the wrong production You picked team. yes people? No, I would. If, if I picked yes people, <laughs> you might it, it might have been just my vision, which would have been better than what it was. Because it became a Frankenstein. Yeah. It was it, half pregnant. Yeah, exactly. And, and I picked a lot of people who told me what I wanted to hear early on, but had their own agendas. Sure. And uh, I was blind to it, and I was so caught up in myself and my own yep. ego that I screwed up a really massive opportunity for myself. Sure, it was a game changer. Yeah. If that goes for a hundo, different things. Well, you I, know what's funny? People always ask me my biggest mistakes, and I always try to come up with something because I don't like to think about my mistakes. I actually like disrespect my mistakes. Right. It's a very interesting thing. Like I recognize them, right. but I give them no fucking energy. Like right. really, I'm like, cool mistake, you go over there, right? Mm -hmm. But no question. My biggest mistakes have been the things that I've passed on and haven't done. Yeah. Like it was interesting to think about like that, and that happened, right? But like, I could have been a judge on Top Chef. I could have done all these other business shows. Like, there's a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, that I always think about the things that I haven't done. Yeah. Even investing, right? I've done well, but passing on Uber twice was the clear one. You I know, did too. everybody did. I know. Everybody had I know. it like that. All right, let's go. Daniela asks. I'm an immigrant with an entrepreneurial dream. All my parents care about is college, which I hate. Any advice? That's tough. Um, Did you get pressured to be a good student? No. Oh. I, I came from one of those families where it was just expected. And, but I learned, right, there was no even, it was right. binary, right? So I, I came from one of those <laughs> There wasn't even a conversation. No, right? no, it just wasn't even a conversation. I came from one of those weird families where high expectations were always there, but my parents were not very good at being parents, and so I was basically ignored. So I kind of had to raise myself, but unconsciously... You had I siblings? Think, no, only child. Only child. Yeah, I think unconsciously I understood at a very young age that the adults were never going to help me. No one was coming to help me. And so I had to learn, like the system as it's presented to you is bullshit. And the only gift they gave me by being terrible parents is that I was never fooled by the lies that the system tells you, like school, right? Uh, I learned how to hack the system. You feel like early on you made a decision that you weren't getting value from your parents and thus every grown up during your youth you looked in a cynical point of view? Not just the grown-ups, but the actual systems that the grown-ups all operate in and represent. Yeah. Whether it's work or whether it's uh, corporations or school. It's not that everything is invalid, it's just that the, the, the face that they present is never the reality. It's so interesting. I, on the other hand, had amazing parents, right. but came to that same realization at a very young age. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, that's... It's so interesting, different paths to get to that place. That's it really I, dictated my life, where I was like, oh my God, I'm not this, and like, I've got another, geez, I was in fourth grade for sure. Right. I'm like, crap, I got another nine years of eating this shit. Well, see, <laughs> you, you got out early. I'm like, how do, I, how do I break this system? How do I hack it and make it work for me? Yeah, you decided to win within it. I decided to literally go on vacation because I realized subconsciously yeah. I was never gonna be on vacation again. You know, <laughs> what's funny is I think, if we're talking about unconscious, uh, I think I, I realized I had no other support. You had great parents. Yeah. You're like, I have this other world yeah, I can sure. go into. I knew the right, only you're like, world. I need this, right. I, I, I need to win that. at this system so that I have, because I don't have anyone What's else. What's the person's name? 
Um, Daniela. Daniela, I'm gonna give you very difficult advice. I really think you need to have the most honest and truthful conversation you've ever had with your parents and then react to their reaction. I think if you really, I don't know if you've ever gone there all the way where like, this is really ruining me. Like, like not like, hey mom and dad, I don't like school. It's like, yeah. I'm suffocating and truly believe my life will not be as good as it could be if I go down this path. Watching your parents' reaction to those words, verbatim, would be, will give you a really good indication because then you get to understand, are your parents wired? to really value you and what you and what where you are and what's in your best interest from your point of view or do they really care about their point of view and what their child's success means to them i've become very fascinated you might have better insight well, to this i grew up in a way where i didn't know like the fancy world and so like bumper stickers of colleges on cars and like and like parents telling kids to take on college debt at better schools. Wait a minute, that's in their interest because they get to tell their friends that University of Chicago is real fancy. I'd be super yeah. pumped if Misha and Xander went there. Like right. I, I'm like, holy crap, that's interesting. Well, so I think that's fantastic advice. Let me just add one sort of uh, uh, way to frame this. So when you go talk to your parents, I think the way to frame it is not here's my argument because you're not never going to convince someone with a compelling argument or very rarely. What you want to do is start by asking them questions. Do you care about me? How much do you care? What do you really care about? What matters the most to you? And what they're going to say is we care about you being happy. We care about you finding yourself. We care about you, whatever, right? Get them to commit to that and then say, all right, if, if you really do care about me and you really do, it, it does matter to you that I'm this happy, I'm gonna tell you I don't wanna go to school because it makes me very, or college, it makes me very unhappy and trying these other things for a year or two is gonna make me much happier. It, will you support me as I do something, at least for, and you can even frame it as temporary. Give me a year to support me and if it doesn't work, I'm happy to go back to college. And support me mentally, right? Like the financial part right. is uh, That's so totally sad. what I mean. I know that. Emotional. I know that. I wanna, I wanna frame that up for people. And I, I would say the other thing, like look, like there's casualties of war and your parents are not gonna be around for your casualties of what they think is in your better interest than versus you. I mean, the gift that I was given that I really wish I could, you know, like stick into every goddamn person is the audacity and confidence at a very young age to just say, this is the deal. Huh. Like, like that independence is incredible and like, and that's hard for a lot of people, but like, if you're asking me on this show, like to me, actions speak louder than words. If you publicly tweeted this and asked me and wanted me to answer, you're just looking for somebody to push you over the finish line. Many of you are watching this and think it, but would never tweet it publicly in fear that your parents would see it. You're clearly this close and you need somebody to nudge you. I'm willing to nudge you. I mean, I really do think there are real moments in time to say, go fuck yourself, mom and dad. And it's real, and it's real not from a bad, cool, like growing out, from a, this is it. Like this is a crossroads, and a lot of people get forced into doing, there are kids with massive debt because they wanted to appease their parents, and they lose, they lose because they kick their 20s and don't take the risk, reward things they should be doing to just pay down the debt, and they wake up at 34, and they just finally are at even from something that they decided at 17. Because their parents pressured them. 100%. Yeah. In their, now that I've gotten older and I'm spending time with parents, in their parents' vested interest of vanity. Yes. The worst. Yeah. Let's do one more. One more. Cause I gotta go to, Video. speaking of parents, I gotta go run to Misha's school and. Hey Gary, I'm Steven from Colombia. I am 10 years old. My question is, if I want to make videos about cars, motorcycles, because I love it, or my life in general, I mean blogs because I love it too, what should I do? Because you say that you were so hard until 30, and you say that people will respect you for your actions. I dream being a successful entrepreneur, and I want respect too, but how I should resolve? Or I should work in silence, I mean, no in camera, no in social media. What should I do, Gary, please? I want to go all in. Uh, I love you, man, and anybody in this planet is like you. Sorry for my English. <laughs> keep inspiring, keep pushing, and gratitude to all your team. Bye. You can even edit this with the little amazing. subtitles, right? Mm -hmm. What's it, Steven? Mm -hmm. Did you say? Steven. Steven, real quick, I'll, I'll jump in and Tucker, please add to anything you can to this. Uh, I want to give you a definition. I said that I built a business until I was 30, 32, and then I talked about business stuff instead of being a 20-year-old giving business advice. 
You're a content producer. You're talking about your opinions. That's different. If you were giving advice as a 10 year old, a 20 year old, 30 year old about building a business or building a motorcycle business or things of that nature, that's very different than you pontificating, giving your two cents, adding to culture, social commentating. So I, what I want to give you a definition is my whole wait to your 30 to talk to the world. If you're going to give advice, I do think it should be predicated on something, advice. You know, giving your two cents, we're all entitled to our opinions. Social commentating, we're all entitled to that. Making videos and commentating, I think the journey of your life and your thoughts and those things is super fine. You clearly, I mean, I would push very hard. What I just saw gave me a nice little tingle. Keep pounding, produce content, use all the platforms, use your youth and native ability on this world that we now live in, musically, Snapchat, produce for all mediums, get it out there. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me like uh, he, he's got a lot of charisma, right? He I could agree. be totally I be agree. a content producer. So then ask yourself what we talked, the very first question, um, what audience do you want to talk to and what do they care about? And there's a lot of young guys, I bet, in Columbia who care about cars and motorcycles and that stuff. If you become the guy who speaks to all of them, that puts you in a great position to start a lot of different businesses. Or I can tell, that's exactly right, or I can tell you another thing. There's a lot of people that are actually just curious what youth life and culture in Columbia is. Like I was watching that, like looking in the background, like can I learn something about what the kids, are? like I actually think just your life is actually mm -hmm. interesting to so many people and nobody can, you know, if you're not in Columbia, you can't produce content around Columbia and so use your advantages that so many people think are disadvantages. Right, exactly. My oh, man. Super nice, man. You get, you get a, a parting shot here, anything you want to ramble on, and then a, a question of the day. A question, this is a great focus group opportunity. Some insight that you may be looking for. There's a ton of aspiring. You want me to ask a question? Yeah, you, every guest gets asked a question a day. There's a ton of aspiring, I mean, hundreds of people have emailed me about writing a book and things of that nature. I know you guys are jamming on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, any question about that yeah, or, any, no. or any insight that you have? Well, I was for? looking on Twitter right before you came in. Yeah. A bunch of people ask questions about writing books. We actually wrote a book that details our entire process. Like, to hire us is really expensive. It's yep. like 20 grand yep. for Book in a Box, but we wrote a book that tells exactly what we Well, let's definitely link that do. up, Stefan. So, just go to bookinabox.com yep. slash Gary. Yep. It, the, your fans can go there and then they get a free copy of the book if they want it. And literally, it's step by step process to use our method to write their own book. It takes more time than if you hire us, but it's the exact same templates, everything's smart the same. again, data in exchange for good content. There Very you go, smart, man. bookinabox.com slash Gary. Good man, thanks for it. And now question, you get to ask any question. Any question. Uh, man, Could be I don't silly, know. Maybe, well, there's no, All right. we'll sit here for so five you, minutes. So you got a smart like, audience who's good at media. Yep. Uh, so uh, anyone who, who's interested, go look at our site, bookinabox.com. What do you think we're doing wrong in terms of messaging or marketing? Free analyzing. Right, our, like our audience are people who, um, uh, who have great ideas for books, who can monetize those ideas, like coaches, consultants, CEOs, entrepreneurs, people who've had success. What are we doing right and wrong to talk to those people? Any ideas you have, please send to me. Tucker at Book in a Box. Uh, I'd love to hear them. Tucker, thanks for being on. Thank you. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them. What's up, guys? Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, please, do I get to link it up anywhere? Is it like in here? Or is it down below? Is it in print or is it in my video? Uh, no, it'll be, it'll be down to your left. It's here, down to my left? Like right here, there's a button? for them to subscribe to my YouTube video? Yeah. yeah, it's that little buggy thing? Yeah. That's right guys, click this! That's right, use that. <laughs>